Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Unity 4J hashtag protect Julian all weekend long live online vigil in support of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. My name is Susie Dawson. I am a journalist and activist and the president of the Internet Party of New Zealand. I am here now with Patrick Henningsen, who is editor in chief of 21st Century Wire, an amazing independent publication, which has done some really courageous work on a number of topics, which cross over with the anti-war and freedom of information postures of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to the to the stream. Thanks. Uh, good to be with you, Susie. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Lovely to finally meet you. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about 21st Century Wire? And also about when you first became aware of the work of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm a, I'm an independent. I guess you call me an independent uh, journalist. And I started 21st Century Wire. It was just a really humble blog about 10 years ago. It's coming up on 10 years now. Uh, but before that, I wrote for a number of um, independent uh, kind of websites that, like Op-Ed News, uh, who, who were kind of big 10 years ago. Uh, but I was an anti-war activist. I was just like, you know, member of the public, irate, concerned, flabbergasted, shocked about what went down in 2003. And that's when I sort of became uh, really politically active in a big way. And uh, so then I, I had trouble submitting my work for years. So I just, uh, I thought, well, what, why don't I just start, finally start my own blog? I, I was very much... Uh, not very technically oriented. I was just really a good, you know, I liked writing, I liked uh, doing a, a research, but I wasn't great uh, on the publishing side, but uh, I learned. And since it's developed into a, a website with a number of contributors, we funded our own investigative work. Uh, we have worked on the ground in the Middle East, funded investigations, independent investigations. We broke in big stories, uh, but we don't have this, anything near the resources that some of the other kind of big alternative media uh, empires do. Uh, but uh, I've worked for a number of other outlets as well, and I still freelance. I write for some magazines, uh, and I just recently graduated from the University of Plymouth with a master's in international relations and global security, uh, which has really helped to sort of round out uh, some of my own personal education, but uh, it's, it's taught me kind of a uh, different language. Uh, I've learned the language of the of the UN, of the establishment, I've done a little more deep reading on some historical matters that have helped to maybe make my analysis a little more relevant, a little deeper now. But uh, in terms of WikiLeaks, I've been following that story forever. I mean, when the the original thrust of WikiLeaks was really uh, had a lot of support behind it because of what uh, what was what was um, disclosed with uh, with Bradley Manning at the time, now Chelsea Manning. Uh, but that was, you know, everybody who was against the Bush administration, who was vehemently anti-war, that's when we had a, a cohesive anti-war left, or not just left, but just a co cohesive anti-war movement, full stop. Um, and so it was very in vogue for the sort of political left to oppose the Bush administration, to oppose Iraq, to support WikiLeaks. And somehow uh, there, there became a split in this, there became a schism. And that's been a focus also of my research. And, and when I speak publicly on this issue. I just spoke about uh, the issue of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, last week in Belfast and also in Derry on the Imperialism on Trial Tour and talked about Chelsea Manning as well and how crucial and important this is uh, in terms of uh, the free press, but also as a fundamental pillar of, of democracy, which I can talk about a little more a little more depth with you in a minute. But, uh, but you know, I was skeptical at first, to be honest, when... <laughs> When WikiLeaks first came on the scene, because there was a lot going on, uh, Libya was going on, Syria was going on, people were out there just frustrated and desperate for answers. And, you know, everyone was expecting everything to come out of WikiLeaks. And of course, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but so over time, I have grown to respect uh, Julian Assange as a, not just as a publisher, but also as a geopolitical analyst, as a com commentator, uh, as a very canny uh, commentator of our times, really, in, in the last few years since he's been isolated. I'll talk a little bit about that too. But um, but I think now it's it's come to a head. This there, there's a red line right now, and WikiLeaks, 
Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, they represent that red line. It's very clear because it, it's going to affect everybody, everybody who publishes. And if you think about the implications of that, it's not just big media outlets, it's everyone who publishes. It's every single application, social media platform. Uh, you know, you have other apps coming out now, like you've had Medium, then you have uh, other new apps will come out that will allow people, journalists, independent journalists to publish. Twitter has become a bona fide journalistic publishing platform. The threads on Twitter, people are doing long threads on Twitter and not articles uh, a lot now. So, and that's that's considered breaking material in terms of, you know, forensic document analysis and things like that. So this is all falls under the purview of this issue right now that this line being held by uh, Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. So it's very clear to me. And personally, it affects my, you know, my website and what I'm doing as well. Every, every single person who's a blogger, who's a journalist, who's in media should, should, this should be the issue right now. And so we've, I've made it a real point to hammer this home, especially in the last few months. When I, and part of that is just to see, just because I've seen the sort of the arc of this current U.S. administration and its willing accomplices uh, w with the U.K. government, what they've been doing in terms of foreign policy, the, the level of aggression. Now you can see that uh, a lot of <laughs> institutions are being dispensed with and cast aside and sort of dismissed like international law, like the UN, like the Security Council, like due process. These are all things that are now kind of, you know, arbitrary, where before we took those for granted as there was some sort of backstop there that we could rely on. Yeah, but, deployment, but anyway, diplomacy ahead. would be another one of those. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, diplomacy. Yeah, exactly. But that, that that's just a rough kind of uh, summary of, you know, where I'm coming from. Well, I, you have echoed many of my own sentiments. I believe that WikiLeaks is like a bulwark, and I believe that they the they are sucking up so many uh, resources of the intelligence agencies who are set to destroy them. That should we allow those agencies to achieve their aim, that they will overrun that bulwark and they will be coming for all of us. I have absolutely zero doubt about that. Those thousands of agents, which we know there are literally thousands across the various agencies that since 2010 have been set for out for the destruction of WikiLeaks, that they will continue. They will they will not stop. They will not resign their positions if they take down Julian Assange. They will be empowered. They will feel empowered to continue and go after the first concentric circle and then the second concentric circle of everybody who they think could ever even dare to be like WikiLeaks. And I think that them being that bulwark has created uh, this vacuum, this uh, safer zone where all of the independent media are currently operating. So it's heartening to me to see that you also, um, that you realize that and you're, you're in touch with that, that uh, this is a human rights issue in terms of Julian's physical body and what is being inflicted upon him. But there are also much larger issues at stake yeah, and and you know, put, putting his his personal issues to the side for a moment because those are very real. But and and this, I'm talking to any critics or any skeptics or people who aren't sure that this is an important issue. W look at the implications of this. Like th this, the implications of this are just so far-reaching uh, that you can't really underestimate it. You know that I've come to realize that this this is everyone's fight. This is this is, is Julian's fight, but but really what he's represented is everybody's fight. So you know that it's um, not just 21st century wire, not just bloggers, uh, not just activists, but you know this is a fundamental pillar of a free democratic society. The 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 ability to uh, uh, to publish, to publish and be damned, as they said in the old days. That's what my uh, old uh, literature teacher. Remember, he used to say that. And when I was a teenager, I didn't know what he was talking about. Now I know. Of course, but a lot of people will regard the fourth estate today as a kind of anachronism. In other words, oh, the fourth estate, that was, that's so 1960s. You know, the, the way Walter Lippmann or some of these great commentators used to talk about the, the values of the press, how important a free press is in a free and democratic society. This was the dominating discourse coming out of the Second World War. 
That's that we, we don't hear that sort of talk anymore. What, what, and, and part of that is, as we know, those of us who are critical of, of, of media who do recognize propaganda will, will know that the, the mainstream media right now is, is, does, spends a lot more of its time, energy, and resources defending the state rather than holding the state to account, echoing the state, acting as stenographers uh, for power, as John Pilger would say, you know, rather than holding power to account. And so that's that's become kind of blatantly obvious. So we have these two characters. We have the publisher. This is represented as as Julian Assange is is the embodiment of this the purest form of this issue. The reason it's the purest form is because WikiLeaks, as a media outlet, or Julian Assange as a publisher, uh, it 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 doesn't do a lot of commentary or you know fluff features with the news or op it. No, it. It takes information in, it vets it, it publishes it, does a bit of curation in terms of presentation. But that's it. It's very pure. It's a very simple remit. And so if you, if you want to talk about the fourth estate, that's like WikiLeaks is just like a pure veneer, um, that, a layer of it that's just completely pure. So it's, a, it's actually a great test case. It's a great test case. So, so that's the publisher. The source is the whistleblower provides the data, provides the information for the publisher. That's Chelsea Manning, who's, who's, our, who's in solitary confinement again right now because uh, the United States government wants to try to uh, coerce Chelsea Manning to rat, essentially, on Julian Assange. I'll use that as a sort of basic term, but what they're trying to do is build a bridge, rebuild a bridge that's not there uh, in terms of uh, you know accusing WikiLeaks of being involved in this sort of the process of Manning leaking the, uh, and, and so therefore uh, equating it with um, a higher level of crime that would sort of take away any sort of press protections as they would stand constitutionally uh, in the United States. This is just a, a sleight of hand. This is a parlor trick, legal parlor trick, lawfare trick that's being used as well as intimidation by the U.S. government. Okay, so, so the story is amazing. The story is amazing. The, the the personal story of Julian Assange is is amazing because this is the kind of this is the Shawshank Redemption story of our generation. It should be anyway for anybody who's in the media, uh, and it's an incredible it's an incredible journey. It's 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 a tragedy. It's an amazing story at the same time. Um, if, if you want to say it's like Papillon, it's the it's the, the the hundred years of solitude. It's it's a great story, but what's what's amazing about it is if uh, Julian Assange is, is stuck in this room uh, in in London, and he, and it's Plato's cave in reverse. He he sees the world fr- from inside the cave. He sees the world with more clarity than the sort of the illusion that's being lived out in the world. And that's the product of, of our mainstream media, of the matrix that is our propaganda machine, our government media complex. And he's brought clarity to that. So, you know, when, when his time inside, I think, has given him an incredible the solitude, incredible amount of focus and sharpness that became really evident last spring after the Skripal incident. Julian Assange was leading the conversation on Twitter. It was unbelievable. He was a force on Twitter, uh, just basically showing all the hypocrisy of the UK government in terms and all the, the, the inconsistencies in the stories of the Skripal affair. Unbelievable. And so he was just gaining so much uh, steam and attention. And, and it was at that time when the establishment probably, you know, his uh, internet access was cut off after that. But right before uh, the Duma uh, incident, the chemical weapons incident in Syria. So imagine if Julian Assange was being allowed a free hand on social media um, during that period. It, it would have just the level of influence that he had as a as a, a really canny analyst uh, was a threat to the establishment. I personally think that's why at that time he was shut down uh, from internet access. That's my personal opinion, because I saw the way the conversation was moving online and everyone was following him, him and Craig Murray, but, but especially him. Uh, and that's a tremendous amount of power. And you can only have, you can only wield that power with, with the knowledge and the knowledge that he has. And in terms of what he knows, in terms of the documents and the publishing that WikiLeaks has done and sort of being able to put that together. So, 
So, so that's and from being yeah, and from being inside um, the systems and, and the documents, but particularly the systems in terms of his past, um, having actually been inside the systems of this um, architecture of control, which is primarily driven by the intelligence services, who are neck deep in things like the Scripple affair, the Duma chemical attack. Um, also, one of the last things that Julian was speaking about was he was taking note of Elizabeth Leavos and Disobedient Media's reporting on Joseph Mifsford's links to UK intelligence, which obviously is one of the components that blows Russiagate to pieces. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that was certainly a factor as well. Yeah, yeah, that's actually coming out right now with um, uh, George Papadopoulos' book, uh, Deep State Target, and he's starting to talk more in the media now on that very point, kind of showing the whole stitch up of, of that side of the, the Russiagate story. But, uh, but just imagine that one, one guy in, in, the, in, the, in a 12 foot by 12 foot room or whatever in Belgravia is basically out muscling the entire foreign office and State Department's propaganda apparatus with a Twitter account. I mean, that's real power, okay? And there's only a few people who can do this and we know who they are. And when people go and they do pay attention to their Twitter feeds when something big happens. And uh, Julian Assange was really important. And I, I, I was, it was uh, heartbreaking that he wasn't there during some of these major events. He wasn't there to lead the conversation uh, as a central focal point. But you know, so for, for all his, his critics you can just discount the man put the man to the side but you know the, the the legal political the societal implications of this uh when you lose these protections i'm talking about the protection of the press the 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 right to publish the 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 protection of the source the, the legal protection the constitutional protection to come forward with with uh, information that could save lives in some cases could be in the public interest, no longer able to come forward. Think of the implications of this. So when you lose these rights, they're not coming back, short of a Jacobin you know, revolution. But let's face it, that's not going to happen in the 21st century, nor would we want it to happen uh, either. But that it's an extreme political metaphor. But you know, that's what I'm saying. These aren't once the state accumulates power, it's very rare in history that anybody can can see short that's of the so major. It, it, it doesn't come back. So that, that, that's a problem. So, so let's look at, uh, the, anyway, I could talk a little bit. I mean, I have, a, I have an opinion on the U.S. legal proceedings uh, and, and the whole grand jury uh, situation, which I think is wrong. Um, but I also think it's usually problematic uh, because the, the whole concept of the, the grand jury, I'm talking about this enclave in Virginia, where a lot of these cases seem to have been heard. Uh, these are kind of national security type cases. They would be classed as. Um, but uh, the top three, the top three that are in the Eastern District Court of Virginia right now yes. is Julian Assange, Kim.com and Edward Snowden. Right. Perfect. And before that, uh, uh, Jeffrey Sterling. Um, Thomas maybe, Drake. Thomas Drake and uh, and John Kiriakou and so forth. Right. Okay, so so I it, the whole concept of a grand jury is is a is a is a controversial concept in America, but in this case in this case I, it, there shouldn't be any controversy, and here's why. I, I can see the value of a grand jury in terms of uh, this having certain things sealed, uh, so as not to sort of. Um, distort or affect uh, due process. But this, this is where the national security argument is bogus because all of this to do with this case with regards to Chelsea Manning, it's all out already in discovery uh, from the previous trials, okay? Uh, everything WikiLeaks is very public aside from what they've tried to gin up with Russiagate, which we now know, or, or Roger Stone, you know, whatever other a political actor you can throw in, it's bogus, okay? so. The, the grand jury in all cases will more often, in fact, all cases will favor the state. You can't beat, you cannot beat the state in this sort of proceeding. So I think a case like this, I think, I think that it's in, it's so much in the public interest. And, you know, remember that the precedent will, will irrevocably change 
irrevocably change society um, as, as a major fundamental pillar of a free society. I'm talking about the free press. Uh, and I'm talking about whistleblower protections. Okay, Th that it, ha it can't be done in secret. It must be done in public. It must be done with full transparency. If it was, I would wager to bet there is not a judge in America that will rule against the press or rule against a publisher on this case, if not have trouble trying this case for the simple reason that Julian Assange, as an Australian citizen, is not in, WikiLeaks is not in the United States jurisdiction anyway, so the whole point of extraditing him would have to be under uh, bogus pretenses. And again, this is the problem with the national security letter, the national security heading. This has become a kind of obsession post 9-11 in America. It's just distorted everything. And this is what we get. We're at that point right now. The, the level of distortion is such that this is the result of it, a complete contortion of due process. And so that's why it's important. That's why I don't think this, this grand jury, I, I, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be happening in this way. That's just given me an amazing thought. It's just that, that's just given me a breakthrough thought. And it's um, in direct relation to the discussion I was just having with ex-NSA technical director, William Binney. Um, we were talking about what the NSA calls the global network, which is its global system of control, um, its relationships with all of the partner agencies of the different countries in the world. And as um, Glenn Greenwald has spoken about many times, the uh, total awareness, total global awareness, they want to see and hear and retain everything everywhere on the planet. The thought that I just had listening to you talk about um, jurisdiction uh, is that usually how it's supposed to work is that there is jurisdiction and then there is control. The, con the jurisdiction is the foundation for the control. It's that you are it is your jurisdiction and therefore you exert control over it. What the global network has done is to build and assert con global dominance, control over the globe, in the absence of global jurisdiction. They, were ne they never had a mandate to do it. They didn't have a mandate in the founding documents of the agencies. They haven't been given a mandate by Congress or their overseers to do it. They just did it. They just built it. They just extended their tentacles out over a number of years. Now what we see with this transnational extension of, um, into a global jurisdiction is them retroactively trying to justify that co those control mechanisms that already exist. So Julian talks about when he was in Germany, um, him being stalked and surveilled from place to place. They followed him throughout Europe. They followed him throughout Western and Eastern Europe, actually, in the UK and Sweden. No matter where he goes on this globe, he is susceptible to those who are persecuting him because they have global control. But what you're discussing is... Um, and what we saw with the FBI illegally operating on New Zealand soil in the raid of Kim.com was that, ex that, that extension of global this, this creation of the global jurisdiction where they're trying to manufacture a legal basis and a right to an area of control that they took purely by force and without any legal basis. Yes, yeah, th th that's... You're, you're you're getting to the end of the arc of this story, um, and and that's that that's exactly where it's heading. I'll comment on that because because I think I might have something that will help bridge the gap to where you to where you've gone there. Okay, but you know, back to the Eastern District of Virginia. So this obsession with national security this will ultimately be the undoing of the free and open democratic society or in the case of the United States, the, the Constitutional Republic. And the U.S. Uh, views itself as the beacon of progress in this regard with mankind, okay? So that's, that's gone and out the window without a fourth estate, without any kind of functioning uh, uh, free press to hold power to account. So I don't think that's an exaggeration in this case um, at all. If you think about it, you know, all the judges, all the congressmen, all the senators, the president of the United States themselves, who swore to uphold and defend the constitution of the United States. Okay. Aside from being in violation of their oath in this case, and that, and all these super bureaucrats and technocrats and cabinet appointees and all these other operatives. Okay. They're actively dismantling the fundamental building blocks of the United States Constitutional Republic. You step back and you think about the implications of that. That's what's happening right now. They're actively doing it. 
and the American people are, are for the most part unaware of this because there is no f real fourth estate holding power to account. It's been completely co-opted for a number of reasons, and we could kind of go into that as, as to why that is. But you know, aside from that, that's why this must be transparent and open due process. And I believe, and I'm not saying that uh, Julian Assange should be extradited to the United States by any stretch of the imagination, but if he was, and if this was done transparently, he would win because there was no judge in America that would want to publicly be on the history books of putting the sort of the dagger uh, into the constitutional republic and basically turning the founding fathers over. There's no judge in America that would want to do that publicly. That has to be done in secret and obfuscated with various layers of bureaucracy, okay, with the, 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 the shadow state apparatuses functioning. But back to what you said is really important. You're talking about the global aspect of it, okay? This is the, there's about a, this, the fact that he's an Australian national who is publishing yeah. in Europe, who's been residing in the UK, and has is protected under the 1951 um, Refugee Asylum Convention. Geneva. Okay, so so th this is where um, this first of all this this administration in the U.S. has issued international law. Full stop. Is, is trampling on the UN at every, threatening the UN, pulling funding for anybody for various reasons, withdrawing from the Human Rights Council, et cetera, bad-mouthing the UN, uh, just making a mockery of the Security Council proceedings, blaming everything on Russia, okay? The, the, the double-edged sword of technology, and, and this, is a, this is something we have to face and to find a solution to, because if, if you think about it, and, and it comes down to it, it, jurisdiction is what you brought up, which is really important. Um, and you, you're talking about, at the end of the day, you're talking about states' influence to exert power within its jurisdiction, right? In, in a way, that's kind of what you were referring to, right? Conventionally, they were supposed to, they're, they're able to exert power within their jurisdiction. But in reality, they have, they have been exerting power globally, and now they're trying to create retroactively, almost mm -hmm. ad hoc, this, this concept of jurisdiction where it doesn't exist. They have no right. Yeah. If, if you think of the fundamental uh, principle of, of democracy, okay, having elections, I'm just giving you a real simple example. Uh, and, and think of how the media, the role the media plays traditionally in elections in terms of influence, uh, influ informing and influencing the public. Now, imagine this, okay? Now, when you run for office, whether it's a city council position, whether it's a, a, a congressional position in Australia, whether it's a mayoral position in London, whether it's, I'll give you an example, Beto O'Rourke ran against Ted Cruz, uh, for the Senate seat in Texas in the last uh, midterm elections, okay? Beto O'Rourke's um, support base wasn't confined to Texas online. If you think of the, the amount of activity and political activity, it's on, it's on monopolistic Silicon Valley platforms like Facebook and Twitter. It's centralized there, okay? So if you have the wave of support of what they call influence, it's on the social media platforms, it's global. So you're campaigning even for a local seat with you have global support that's going to not just amplify, but distort what your real support might be within your district. OK, and you can you can ramp this up and scale this up to presidential elections. OK, this is a huge problem for democracy as we once knew it. OK, in terms of uh, nation states. So the, the this is the catch 22 with with technology, with the Internet is, is we, we have some rough waters to navigate in the, in the short term uh, with regards to how the state's going to, or the power structure, or the elite, or the, all of the plutocracy, how they're managing this. And they're not managing it very well at the moment. So what are they doing? They want to balkanize the internet. They want to, this is what Russiagate's about. It's not Russian influence. It's people influence. That's the threat. It's not the Russians, okay? RT is like a, a, a dust speck. And RT is featured heavily in the intelligence assessments reports. It's all they talk about, RT, RT. RT's reach is minuscule compared to the collective uh, government media complex in the United States. So what are they afraid of? They're just afraid of what RT represents, which is a counter-narrative, which is counter-memming, which is satire, 
uh, which is, you know, jokes that go viral, things coming from RT, viral videos. But all RT did when RT started in 2007, they just mimicked what the alternative media was doing at the time because they saw an opening in the market, the, the, the marketplace of ideas. They looked at that. They said, okay, this is popular. This is trending. This is going mercurial. We're going to do this. And guess what? They became the biggest YouTube channel at the time in history. They first to go over a billion views. They, and they didn't, they're doing this with a $300 million uh, a year budget. Okay, This is like tiny compared to CNN's budget or NBC's budget or the BBC's budget, which are upwards of, of over a billion in some cases per year. So in terms of media impressions, it's uh, RT's nothing. Uh, in terms of media impressions, the blogosphere is, is small. Okay. But what it represents is the ability to organize outside of those sort of corporate uh, plantations that have more or less, you know, enjoyed a kind of monopoly of influence, as it were, in the democratic process. They pick and choose winners, basically. The, back in the old days, there was three networks and uh, five major newspapers in the U.S. And if, you, if they were behind you, you're going to win. For, you know, Ross Perot some of these challenge, third party challengers over the years, they had no chance, okay? If they came today, they might have a better chance, but or an insurgent within a party has a better chance today than they did before. This is a huge problem. And you can be embarrassed globally now as well. You can have a great career and something breaks. A New Zealand journalist could break a story about Joe Biden that could destroy Joe Biden's campaign once it cascades across Twitter, you know, this, we're living in a totally different world now. So in terms of control, controlling the narrative, it's, it's very difficult. It's very problematic. And I see the establishments lashing out now in, in an authoritarian way, wanting to balkanize uh, regional internets, using Russia as a pretext for that, or China, or whatever, terrorism. Uh, it's, it's, that's what I see happening now. To, to deal with the very problem which you brought up in, at the beginning of this part of our conversation. I think, it, I think the two are linked, basically. Absolutely. And when you're talking about those um, media budgets, uh, WikiLeaks in its best year made a million dollars and WikiLeaks controlled a global conversation and WikiLeaks uh, drove the direction of major media uh, in multiple continents simultaneously. Um, and I've seen it in my own life. I was actually laughing before when you were talking about Julian's ability with a single tweet to um, blow an, an information bomb under a narrative, under a fixed narrative. You know, um, I saw it myself because in New Zealand, I was taking on the Minister of Police, the Minister of Justice, the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office. And I was blacked out by media. I was had the security services after me. I, my work was suppressed in every imaginable way. And Julian and WikiLeaks would go and take my link to my completely suppressed work and tweet it to then 3.2 million people on Twitter, now over 5 million. And instantly it would blow the lid on it. Instantly every journalist and member of the media in New Zealand was forced to pay attention to that. And it completely changed um, the way that, that things unfolded. Um, and that was the power of WikiLeaks for us. I mean, I understand they have, they have so much influence and power in so many different ways, but that they could take one at-risk independent uh, journalist who has no resources or ability, but uh, ability to um, crack those stories nationally the way they needed to be done. Um, and Wiki one tweet from WikiLeaks was enough to do it, and they would just do it year in and year out just another stick on the donkey's back another stick on the donkey's back and it was just an amazing experience for me to see to go from being completely blacked out and suppressed to everyone knows it and no one can hide it and that, that's yeah, so just am amazing and and wikileaks has done that with caitlin johnson's work with elizabeth leavos's work where there's a whole host of independent journalists over the years, you know, even during the Chelsea Manning coverage with Alexa O'Brien, the uh, WikiLeaks and Julian have always picked the cream of the crop of independent journalists and raised them up, raised their profiles up and, and um, showcased their work in a way that we could never have hoped in our wildest dreams would, would happen.
Yeah, I wish they would uh, do that for 21st Century Wire one of these days. <laughs> I think they have sent, I'm pretty sure they did. I think they've tweeted um, one of your articles before. I'm not sure. We could use, we could use, a, we could use a boost because um, I've been attacked by the Huffington Post, my colleague Vanessa Bealey, by the Times, the Sun, the BBC, uh, Voice of America, CNN, all running various types of hit pieces on our work because of what we've reported in Syria. But yeah, so we can use a little bit of a boost. But but anyway, back to what you're saying, okay? That WikiLeaks doesn't even need to publish what you've done. They just need to retweet it. And it's going to go viral based on their credibility, okay? Because they've built up a 10-year perfect record that, that that's, you know, in terms of accuracy. So this is also a credibility war, okay? And right now they're targeting WikiLeaks and Julian Assange's credibility. And I, I, I'll bet you if he gets, I hope, I hope it doesn't happen, but if they do render him, the, the U.S. press will probably go into overdrive in terms of hysterical uh, de defamation attacks against Julian Assange. And I don't look, I, I will or not look. They, there is a possibility that they might just disappear him. Because I've heard a lot of talk about people, oh, when he gets prosecuted, oh, when he gets to testify, there is no guarantee whatsoever that they'll ever let him anywhere near a courtroom or a judge. There is every possibility that having already secretly designated him an information terrorist uh, nine years ago, that they will disappear, simply disappear him. And yeah. between the NDAA, which already authorizes that on US citizens, the idea that him not as a U.S. citizen would be treated any better, um, you know, I, I don't see it, quite frankly. Um, he was on a Pentagon manhunt list from August 2010 that he was never taken off of. He has had FBI teams, Pentagon teams, DHS teams, CIA teams, um, and that's just the American side of the equation, after him. He has still been publishing to this day. He's managed to still publish to this day, despite those, I mean, resources beyond, I'd say, hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it's arguable that maybe it's topped a billion. What, what has been spent just trying to get their hands on him? The idea that they are just going to fly him back and put him in the county jail and send him off to trial with a judge in a courtroom, is, it's not going to happen that way. They will torture the shit out of him. They will want the codes to the insurance files. They will want to know everything that there is to know about the inner workings of WikiLeaks, how he was able to do what he does. They will pick his brain clean and then they will try to silence him and they will try to silence him permanently. And that's one of the reasons that I, there's, um, you know, the whole QAnon thing. One of the narratives is, oh, it's all part of the plan, we'll just bring him back and he'll go to court and testify and then Hillary Clinton will go to jail and Julian Assange will be set free. Bullshit. I mean, come on, let's be real. There's no way that after nine years of trying to get their hands on him that, that, that that's what's going to happen. And we have to yeah. fight against that because, you know, we're talking about global jurisdiction, global control, you know, the, what was done to Kim, what was done to Snowden with them downing a presidential jet here in Europe, trying to get their hands on him, what's done with Julian in terms of him being stalked all over Europe and set up and framed and now in the embassy for however many years. These, these people, the intelligence agencies that persecute Julian, the governments that persecute Julian, they are the ultimate globalists. They want a system. They want to enhance their system of global control. And they have spent many years establishing that system and they'll do everything that they can to protect it. And they see WikiLeaks as a key threat to that system of global control because WikiLeaks has proven that they are able to slice straight through all of these mechanisms of censorship and everything else that have been established. Um, you, you, so, you, so yeah, you that, said that that's my two when their budget, what'd you say? They're like a million a year was their budget and the impact Ridiculous. they've had. Yeah. 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 So, so, so why is that? That's a, that's a question or an independent media blogger, WikiLeaks, whoever uh, it, it, because it, it costs a fortune to push, you know, what uphill the truth costs, <laughs> very, the truth costs so little to go viral and to, to, to emerge because people recognize the truth. The people recognize good journalists, many of who you've mentioned as well, and many who we know some of them in the mainstream. There's a few left, okay? There's a few, they're like rare, 
rare species, rare dinosaur, endangered species. We know what that sounds like. It doesn't cost a lot for that to get passed around and spread. Uh, it costs a fortune. It's eating up so much of our state resources, our public money, to try to apprehend and, and try to squash the truth. And WikiLeaks and Julian Assange represents that, that waste uh, by the state that waste of public funds that could be used for so many other things, the waste of legal energy, the waste of political capital, the waste of so many different things, uh, and, the, and the media's waste of money, the media's waste of, of airtime, uh, pushing lies, basically, avoiding stories rather than, uh, um, rather than embracing some of the stories that WikiLeaks has broken. They're just ignoring them and, and then instead persecuting Assange and WikiLeaks. The whole system is inverted right now. This We're at the most critical stage, uh, I, I would say, is, uh, we've ever been in Western society in terms of where we're at with what we, you know, our free world, our, you know, Western democracy, uh, rules-based international order, blah, blah, blah. We're at the worst position we've ever been in. And this case is the red line, 100%. Because if you lose free speech, and Americans, if you lose the First Amendment, you lose all of your Bill of Rights. So you don't get, and it, you've, you've lost everything. And the press, Assange, free speech, the source, the whistleblower, they represent that. And so it's, uh, yeah, everyone, everyone should recognize this right now, but they're not. And I'm a hope, I, I think more are though, more are and, and more have been in re recent months. George Galloway did a UK special on Assange recently and he walked down the street in London asking every Tom, Dick and Harry walking past, hey, what do you think of Assange? What do you think of Julian? What do you think of WikiLeaks? Almost all of them are in support. So I think that, um, I think even we as activists can easily be led to believe that because these relentless smears are coming out of the big publications that, you know, less people support Julian and, and WikiLeaks than actually do. But in reality, the man on the street seems to be a bit more resilient and a bit more savvy than we might give them credit for, I think. But thank you so much for being here and for advocating. Well, your words have been really important. This has been a dynamite conversation, actually, and I'd, I'd love to continue it at another time. Mm -hmm.